We at Right on Crime are very pleased that Congress is examining various, various options for reining in unnecessary federal criminal laws that are properly the province of state governments, ensuring, as Chairman Goodlatte said, uh, that there's a couple mental state required for conviction, uh, reexamining uh, mandatory minimums for nonviolent offenses, uh, implementing evidence-based practices and community supervision, improving programming in federal prisons, and strengthening reentry so we can reduce that high recidivism rate that Mr. Otis talked about. Uh, we're committed to the Tenth Amendment and to making sure that uh, criminal justice matters, uh, the garden variety street crimes are the province of state and local governments. Uh, we uh, recognize that uh, although there's been a six-fold increase in incarceration rates from uh, the early 70s to today, that some of that was necessary, uh, particularly to incarcerate violent and dangerous offenders for long periods of time. But we believe uh, that uh, the pendulum swung too far, and now we have too many nonviolent and low-risk offenders behind bars, and that uh, through developments and new technologies and techniques, whether they're drug courts, electronic uh, monitoring, risk and needs assessments, we have a better ability to supervise more nonviolent offenders in the community. Over the past several years, we've worked with conservative governors, conservative lawmakers across the country to enact successful uh, reforms, including many dealing with mandatory minimums that we're discussing today. Uh, as an example, 29 states in the last decade have reduced uh, mandatory minimums relating to nonviolent offenses, and crime has continued to decline. Uh, one example was South Carolina uh, reduced mandatory minimums as part of a comprehensive reform in 2010, and crime has declined dramatically in South, South Carolina, 14% since reducing those drug mandatory minimums. So uh, we would argue that uh, we need to reexamine mandatory minimums for several reasons, and, and, and simply those, of course, on violent offenses. Uh, number one, of course, uh, they can result in excessive prison terms. And the reality is the vast majority of those affected by it are not uh, supervisors, leaders, kingpins. That's only 7% of those cases. And so uh, instead, what we need to do is look at the fact that most uh, individuals uh, affected by federal drug mandatory minimums are, in fact, nonviolent. Uh, half, uh, only half, uh, more than half, had no prior criminal record, 84% no weapon involved. Now, certainly, uh, we can also see, even outside of the drug issue, another example is when somebody has ever had an offense, even decades ago, they can't have a gun or they're subject to federal mandatory minimums. There was a gentleman in Tennessee who had a hunting turkey with a rifle and had a minor offense decades ago, ended up with a 15-year mandatory minimum. And the federal judge in that case, like many other federal judges, including many conservative ones like Judge Cassell, have said, the sentence I'm being forced to hand down by this mandatory minimum is excessive. Um, now, of course, mandatory minimums are supposed to produce uniformity, but they have not uh, done that. And part of that is because of the enhancements, the 851, the 924 enhancements that prosecutors can file. And what we've seen is uh, across uh, various districts, uh, the rate at which those enhancements are filed varies dramatically. Um, in one district, uh, it was 3,994 percent more likely to file an enhancement than another. Um, and another question is really we have to look at essentially uh, – the main reason mandatory minimums for nonviolent offenses came into being was that the concern that judges were uh, exercising excessive discretion. But interestingly, in fiscal year 2013, only 17.8 percent of the below guideline sentences were as a result of judicial departures. More than 38 percent, and this is drug offenders, uh, came from urging of prosecutors for substantial compliance uh, and other reasons. So uh, judges are actually adhering uh, very closely to the sentencing guidelines in more than 80 percent of the cases. It's also been argued mandatory minimums are necessary to require uh, to uh, encourage defendants to plead guilty. Um, 97 percent of federal cases are resolved by guilty plea. And in fact, the Sensing Commission found a greater percentage of those federal criminal charges that don't uh, uh, apply to mandatory minimums resulted in a guilty plea uh, compared to those that uh, where mandatory minimums do apply. Now, we certainly don't want to have unlimited discretion. In Texas, for example, we have uh, uh, sentencing ranges for various crimes. Eighteen states have sentencing guidelines. There does need to be some constraint on judges. So I think it's a false dichotomy to say we have to just uh, go back to where judges can uh, decide on any sentence willy-nilly. Now, uh, let me just address a couple of other issues. One is that uh, we're still talking about people going to prison for a long time. Uh, when the crack powder disparity was narrowed in 2010, those who have subsequently, subsequently been convicted of crack cases have received an average federal prison term of 97 months. That's real time. 
And uh, let me just also conclude by saying we would urge Congress to rein in overcriminalization by consolidating all the federal criminal laws in one code, adopting a rule of construction that applies a strong mens rea protection when the underlying statute is unclear, codifying the rule of lenity, uh, which says that when there's two objectively reasonable interpretations of a statute, the one favoring the defendant should prevail, and finally, 